Join me at CMC. Get engaged and get educated. Join me at CMC. Everyone is welcome. Join me at CMC. Come grow your relationships.
Join us at CMC. CMC is real, authentic conversation. Engage with curious people. Plus, we give you access to thought leaders. Be informed, be inspired. Through community conversation. Come here and meet your neighbors. Be here in the room. Ask questions. Get Get answers. answers. Connecting people and ideas. Learn about Columbus. Who will you see at CMC? Join me at CMC. You're invited. Watch us on live stream or in person. You're invited. Join the conversation. You're You're invited. Welcome to CMC. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. It is such a nice thing to see so many people here today. We've got Supreme Court justices. We've got judges from all of our courts. We've got former governors. What a wonderful, wonderful turnout. Founded in 1976 by 13 visionary women leaders, including Sally Bloomfield, who's here with us today, (laughs) CMC's mission is to connect people and ideas through community conversation. To carry out this mission, CMC explores public policy issues, current events, and lessons in leadership every Wednesday. From its beginning, CMC has welcomed everyone, and I welcome you here today. I'm Joelle Kuzam, Partner and Employment Practice Chair at Bricker and Eckler. I'm also a member of the CMC Board of Trustees. Please help me in welcoming CMC's newest members today. We've got with us Brandon Umbro, Embrius and Christine Sanducci with Schneider Downs, Allison Justice with Advanced Drainage Systems, Tony Macaluso with Columbus Realtors, Jennifer Trammell, and our newest lifetime member, Carrie Schmidt with Plentiful. Welcome to CMC. If you're not already a CMC member, please join. It's easy to do through CMC's website, and you'll get to wear one of these very sought after green name tags the next time you attend a forum. Please also take a moment to look at the back of your forum flyers. You'll see all the organizations that provide the nonprofit uh, Columbus Metropolitan Club with half of its annual revenue. To join these sponsors, please see Jane Scott, Jane, please wave, or Lainey Cuthbert, who is over by the doors with CMC. Thank you to CMC's Democracy in Crisis series partners, WOSU Public Media. Thank you to today's forum sponsors, the Chief Justice Thomas J. Moyer Legacy Committee of the Ohio State Bar Association. And we have with us Justice O'Connor and where did he go? Steve, Steve Stover, who are here. We thank them for their support and also the law firm of Ulmer and Byrne, and we have Brax Luttrell here with us as well. You'll find information about the Moyer Legacy Fund at your place settings. Today's live stream is presented by the Columbus Dispatch. Let's thank all of those who supported today's forum. (laughs) Fair and impartial courts are critical to our democracy and to the rule of law. Can our courts withstand an era when personal attacks on our judges and legislative assaults on courts have become frequent? Public trust in judges can also become eroded when those judges are seen or portrayed as politicians in robes. With today's speakers, we'll explore the role of courts in preserving American democracy and the role that civic education can play in protecting our fair and impartial judiciary. It's our great honor to welcome today's panel. Michael Curtin, retired reporter, editor, and associate publisher of the Columbus Dispatch, and a former member of the Ohio House of Representatives to my immediate left. Next to him, we have the Honorable Richard A. Fry, judge with the Franklin County Court of Common Pleas. Next to Judge Fry, we have Kathleen Trafford, a litigation partner with Porter Wright, Morris, and Arthur, and a fellow with the American College of Trial Lawyers. 
And then finally on the end, we have the Honorable Michael H. Watson, judge with the United States District Court for the Southern District of Ohio. And shortly, our host, Yvette McGee-Brown, will be taking this position. Yvette, Yvette is the former Ohio Supreme Court Justice, former Franklin County Court of, Domest of Common Pleas Judge, and currently a partner with Jones Day, where she also heads up their Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. You can learn more about today's speakers in your forum flyer. Yvette, please join us on the stage. We look forward to today's conversation. Oh, Steve will come up first. <laughs> Thank you, Joelle, and thanks to the Columbus Metropolitan Club for inviting the Chief Justice Thomas J. Moyer Legacy Committee of the Ohio State Bar Association to sponsor this event. As a member of the Metropolitan Club and chair of the Moyer Committee, I'm delighted that this is the fifth Moyer Lecture Series program at the Metropolitan Club, and we were in view of the building that bears Chief Justice Moyer's name. Today, we have seven members of the Chief Justice Moyer uh, Legacy Committee here with us, right here. We also have uh, the Honorable Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Ohio, Maureen O'Connor, and I think I saw Justice Bruner come in just, there you are, Justice Jennifer Bruner is here. Uh, many of you knew Tom Moyer, the great Chief Justice and leader, facilitator, and mentor. The Moyer Legacy Committee was founded in 2010 to provide a lasting memorial to Chief Justice Moyer's dedication to the administrative justice and public understanding of the law. The Chief Justice Moyer Committee has accomplished much in 12 years, <clears throat> establishing the Chief Justice Moyer Professorship for the Administration of Justice and the Rule of Law at the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law, creating the Moyer Fellowship Program to provide research opportunities for students at all of Ohio's nine law schools, hosting a 2013 event featuring United States Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, a great friend of the Chief Justice and Justice O'Connor's, who delivered an address on civics, education, and civility, founding the Ohio Civility Consortium, a statewide collaboration of groups supporting civility and public discourse like the Metropolitan Club and establishing this Chief Justice Moyer Lecture Series to present high quality lectures featuring noteworthy speakers to advance civil public discussion of the important issues of the day. We've had the uh, announcement of the uh, Congressional Civility Caucus. <clears throat> we had uh, John Dean, former White House counsel, and last year's Behind the Curtains at the Supreme Court of Ohio featuring current and former justices of the court. Today, our distinguished panel will discuss the importance of fair and impartial courts in maintaining our democracy and the rule of law, public trust and confidence in the courts, and challenges to these fundamental tenets and the need to preserve the least understood branch. Uh, you've already known uh, Yvette McGee-Brown, former Supreme Court Justice, Jones Day partner, and a founding member of the Moyer Legacy Committee. Yvette will introduce our outstanding panel here, and we look forward to an interesting conversation. Yvette? All right, I have them right where I want them. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Um, I don't need to introduce them. You all know who they are. Um, I'm really pleased by the turnout today and having a couple of our justices, including our historic chief, the first woman justice of the Ohio Supreme Court, and some of the reporters that used to follow me, that Kathy Kandiski and Mary Yost. So I'm going to start right in um, with questions. And this is a great panel. And we hope that you will be asking questions later. So if you have them, write them down. And then at the back, there'll be a microphone where you can ask. Um, so let's start with this. Recently, we've seen um, how the public has lost confidence in judges. 
And as we all know, and we all believe sitting up here, that the judicial branch, that judges really are the cornerstone of democracy. You know, we call balls and strikes, and it pains me every time I hear somebody talk about a conservative judge or a liberal judge, because we're just judges and we're just uh, applying the law to the facts. You know, what do you think about the current climate? And do you think we can get past this? Because you know, not to be a pessimist, but if you look at what happened in Germany, the first thing they did was get rid of the judges. And then we know what followed that. So Kathleen, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Um, I'd be happy to, thanks Yvette. Um, I think an important caveat to start with though is the difference between the different ways we can respond to judicial decisions. Um, if you have a legitimate principle disagreement um, with a judicial decision, um, that's one thing. On the other hand, if you have a personal attack on the integrity of the judge who decides the decision or the court itself, that's an entirely different issue. And the former, the, the um, legitimate disagreement with decisions of the court, that's um, perfectly appropriate. In fact, it really attests to the strength of our democracy. But when you cross the line and start attacking the judges themselves or the integrity of the court, that's an entirely different matter. And it's those kind of attacks, especially when they come from public officials, that really send a signal to the public that the courts aren't fair and impartial and the work of the courts is not to be respected. So keep that distinction in mind. Obviously today we're gonna to be talking about the latter kinds of attacks, the, the attacks that cross the line. And there's really nothing new or novel about those kind of attacks. Um, if we look to history, we can see what's happened. Um, attacks, um, pretty um, caustic attacks on the courts go way back to the beginning of the Republic. I mean, Thomas Jefferson, when he was president, would just rail against both Justice Marshall and try to impeach Justice um, Samuel Chase because he believed they were being um, um, dictatorial justices who were trying to interject the anti-democratic principles of the Federalists into the, their decision-making. Um, you had Teddy Roosevelt, who also was very critical of Oliver Wendell Holmes, said he was you know, a spineless, had no backbone because he wouldn't support um, the president's um, trust-busting initiative. And of course, Franklin Roosevelt tried to um, pack the court with justices he believed would be supportive of the New Deal. Um, probably the most classic lesson from history is Brown versus the Board of yeah. Education, which created a tidal wave of criticism of the Chief Justice Earl Warren in the court. Um, and if, according to the congressional record, these attacks came from all over the country, not just from the South. And they were very caustic and bitter. There were billboards all over the country saying impeach the Chief Justice. Um, there were efforts to um, have by Congress to try to change the, the um, jurisdiction of the courts. Um, we had legislators, governors, and even some judges trying to attack the legitimacy of the court because of that decision. And a common theme was that a, a court decree doesn't deserve any respect unless it's consistent with the popular opinion. Um, another recent example is Bush versus Gore. You know, you can disagree with the analysis of the court's various, the justices' various opinions in that case, but that kind of got overshadowed by the claims of judicial activism, partisanship. There was even claims of conflict of interest on the part of some of the justices. Um, and we survived those kinds of attacks in the history. Um, the country was able to get past that. I worry now the climate's uh, markedly different. And I think part of the problem is the attacks are on the rise. Um, they're much more vitriolic today. Um, they're more partisan and tribal. And you have to look to social media as part of the problem because the attacks are instantaneous and so widespread so quickly, there's no time for any kind of thoughtful, um, response um, to correct misleading and sometimes false information. Mm -hmm. So um, that, like you, I hate to be pessimistic about it, but I think the times 
are more difficult now, that we really can be talking about a crisis in, in democracy because of the attacks on the courts. Um, Thanks, Kathleen. Let's turn to our great historian because, you know, one of the things I miss about the current climate we live in today is the lack of a of a newspaper that does in-depth um, reporting. Um, and I grew up um, reading, I shouldn't say grew up, as a young adult, I read <laughs> The extensive articles that Mike Curtin used to do. And, you know, it was just such a joy to watch him um, write those articles. He and Mary Yost used to do these long pages and pages on the State House. Mike, really follow up with what Kathleen said. You study history, you particularly study Ohio history. What do you think of our current climate? I would agree with Kathleen that it's worse than it's been in quite some time, worse than it's been in uh, many of our lifetimes. Um, and if you doubt that judgment, just pay attention to the climate between now and November 8th in the three races for our Ohio Supreme Court. I, I hope I'm wrong, uh, but I believe that what we'll see between now and November 8th are records amounts of money, uh, including record amounts of dark money spent on those three races. Um, we'll see uh, hyper-partisanship like we've not seen before in Supreme Court races, in the, in, at least not in the recent past. Uh, we'll see a lots of misinformation on TV. We'll see lots of disinformation on social uh, media. Um, it's going to be ugly, very ugly. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd bet quite a bit of money on that and hope that I would lose it. Uh, just to prove that I don't romanticize the past, to uh, if that's the point, Ohio has had plenty of tough storms of criticism in the past, and then we have survived them. Uh, our original Ohio Constitution of 1802 empowered the General Assembly to appoint all judges. Um, and it didn't take long for the public to see what that meant. Uh, the public, within a very short period of time, got very upset with a lot of cronyism at best, corruption at worst. And by the 1830s, with uh, the spirit of Jacksonian democracy rising here and elsewhere, Ohio then 76 counties approaching 1 million population, the demand for change was heard at the State House and uh, in our 1850 Constitutional Convention, uh, that growing dissatisfaction led to uh, an amendment uh, to the Constitution requiring that all judges would be elected uh, in the state at all levels. Uh, and that provision remains in effect today, 171 years later. And it, of course, has come in for lots and lots of criticism uh, itself. In fact, by the early 1900s, the criticism on an elected judiciary was pretty extensive, and that led in 1911 to what was called the Nonpartisan Judiciary Act. <clears throat> Imagine that, uh, requiring the nonpartisan election of all judges in general elections. Translation no party labels. Uh, judges would be nominated in partisan primaries, but they would be elected in uh, nonpartisan judicial elections, and that was expected to cure a lot of the hyper-partisanship of the, of the day. Uh, well, from 1912 until this year, that stood. But uh, last year, the General Assembly saw fit to pass and Governor DeWine signed legislation to put party labels back on uh, judicial ballots, at least for appellate uh, judgeships and Supreme Court judgeships. So when you go to the ballot booth uh, or fill out your ballot this year, you'll see party labels for Supreme Court uh, races. Um, and as, as a final historical note, um, over the 171 years that we've been electing judges, Ohioans twice were asked by the Bar Association and its allies to move away from uh, elected judges at the appellate level and Supreme Court level to the so-called merit selection uh, plan. And uh, Ohioans didn't like either proposal in 1938 or 1987, voted them both down by about two to one margins. The first one in 38 lost in all 88 counties. The second one in 87 lost in 80 to 88 counties. So we've had um, uh, Highlands twice say we like electing judges. It's going to be with us for a while. So the system we have that is the system we have, and 38 other states have a similar system. And so it's how do we improve the system we got with all the ills that we're going to talk about today. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. It used to be an old saying, I guess, until a few months ago, that once you gave the public a right, you couldn't take it away. Um, guess that's no longer the case. Um, <laughs> Judge Fr <laughs> Judge Fry, you have been in the eye of the storm, um, calling balls and strikes, and you had a case 
couple of years ago where uh, you made a decision based on the law and you were attacked um, by the Republican Party. Do you see that happening more frequently? Um, perhaps a little bit, but I'm not sure that um, it ought to be a theme of this kind of a discussion because people have always been critical of judges and justices. Kathleen mentioned uh, impeach Earl Warren uh, billboards that were all over the United States when I was a kid. Um, it's part of the government system that we have courts and people for good or bad reasons sometimes don't like the government and that runs down to even those of us that are just trial judges. The problem is that, as uh, has already been mentioned, it's not just an age-old criticism, but now it's a magnified criticism because of social media. And it's also magnified by things like the absence of uh, as much civics education for our young people as we used to get back when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s. It's magnified because some TV shows will um, really run on about criticism of judges or they'll show judges taking bribes or they'll do things that um, undermine in modest theatrical ways respect for judges and the law. Uh, I've read more than one interview with somebody my age who said they became a lawyer because of the old CBS show that was on at eight o'clock on Saturday night called Perry Mason. <laughs> right. And I'm one of them. I thought it was a magnificent career and he won all his cases and you know, <laughs> it, it really looked like something I'd, I'd enjoy. Um, and so here I am, but um, the, the risk and the, the problem is, is very much with the public and how this leaves jurors. Mm -hmm. We expect people that are impartial to show up for jury service. Well, if they show up with predispositions against the prosecutor's office because they think they're uh, biased against half the community, or if they show up thinking that everybody that's arrested is a criminal and ought to be convicted and put in prison for the rest of their lives, or they show up thinking that doctors are crooks and that medical care is bad and therefore they ought to rule for every plaintiff in a medical malpractice case. Those kinds of things, even with one juror, really raise havoc with the system, particularly in criminal cases where verdicts have to be unanimous. You get prosecutors and police officers will talk to you about the fact that there'll be a shooting in Bicentennial Park and there'll be dozens of people there and nobody will come forward and talk about what they saw. Was it a man that pulled the trigger or a woman? Or was it an African-American or was it a white guy or a Hispanic person? And how many people were really involved? And did they leave in a car and what color was the car? You don't get any of that. Even basic kinds of civics responses from witnesses. And then when you send them a subpoena, it may or may not show up. A subpoena has in some sense become an invitation or a suggestion that you come to court. <laughs> Um, literally, I had a trial this week, the prosecuting witness didn't show up and he hadn't been responding to phone calls from prosecutors, so they just dropped the charge. Mm -hmm. um, he'll probably call or write your old newspaper a letter and say how bad the prosecutor's office is because they didn't have a trial in their case. But literally, we have those kinds of fallouts for jurors and witnesses. Uh, and then I think, and we don't like to talk about this, um, because we're all educated and we all say we respect the government, but what's it do to people paying taxes? Or what's it do to people who don't honor business contracts? Or what's it do to people who think it's okay to bribe a member of the General Assembly? Or what about cheating your investors if you're a public company? Those kinds of trickle down things that come from disrespect, not just of judges, but of the court system and of the law and of the societal contract that we promise each other, those are really bad. And finally, I'd mention that what's it do to the state of Ohio's reputation? Um, I had somebody recently say to me, we've become North Mississippi. <laughs> um, think about how bad that really means. But the New Yorker <laughs> last month on August 6th issue had an article about the redistricting uh, difficulties we have had that included this line, Ohio has become the Hindenburg of democracy. Wow. And that there were two issues of the Christian Science Monitor that I tumbled across that talked about the Ohio redistricting fight for their readers, one in January and another one in July. 
And these kinds of things really, you know, we're trying to get business to Ohio. We're trying to keep our kids from moving out of state after they finish up the street at Ohio State. And then they take their degrees to South Carolina or somewhere else. Um, it, it's pretty serious. And I hope groups like this will continue your efforts to help us. Yeah. And Judge Watson, I'm going to get to you because you can't answer this question, given your role as a federal judge. But I do want to go back to what Judge Fry said. So there has been a history of the public attacking decisions of judges. But I think what we see now are people in leadership and elected office. You brought up those articles about the chief justice. Those comments, many of them were from our elected leaders. And when you have elected leaders not abiding by court orders and attacking the chief justice of one of the branches of government, how does that do anything but undermine confidence in the courts? You asking me? No, no, I'm not asking you. No, <laughs> not asking you. I'm asking the other three. <laughs> well, no, I, I think that, that's a, a very valid point because when it's our our own leaders are telling the public, you mm -hmm. don't need to trust the courts. Um, and that's why like now in uh, poll in June of 2022, only 25% of the American public has confidence in the Supreme Court. And why is that? It's because they're hearing over and over again, these attacks, um, disrespectful, not just of the decision, but of the judges who are deciding the cases or of the court. We're back to the days of back in Brown versus Board of Education, where if your a court decision doesn't mirror the public opinion or the majority opinion, well, it doesn't deserve respect. That's a terrible, terrible message to be sending to the public. And I don't know how we convince our, our elected leaders um, or the pundits that this is what they're causing, that they are a big part of the problem. So to that point about the difference between a, criticizing severely a decision and criticizing the individuals, uh, we need to teach history as part of civics education. And mm -hmm. I'm reminded of, you know, perhaps our greatest president, Lincoln, uh, who was citizen Lincoln in 1857 when the Dred Scott decision came down, arguably one of the worst decisions in our nation's history, certainly from today's lens. Uh, that was a seven to two decision. Uh, obviously, it split the nation. The nation was being split um, in, in the way that we all know. And yet, in his public speaking, uh, Lincoln condemned the decision, but not any of the justices. And he urged his supporters at rallies, at his speeches, that the rule of law must be respected. We must work for a change of that decision. Uh, he, he was purposeful in not attacking the seven members of the majority in that decision. Uh, he basically said, we will get a series of rulings over time. We offer no resistance to this decision, but we will work to overturn it. And so there's these historical lessons. That's to me, right. that's first and foremost. But there's many of our best leaders over time strongly, strongly taken on a decision, but not the judges in the robes who rendered it. That's right. And the courts are there to protect the minority against <laughs> the passions of the majority. Judge Watson, as a federal judge, you have the spot that many of the jurists in this room would love to have. <laughs> and do you receive attacks? Does the federal judiciary at the trial court level receive the kind of attacks we've seen so often on the Supreme Court? I don't think to the same extent, but we do get attacks from time to time. Uh, my colleague, uh, our Chief Judge Marbley, has been criticized for some of his opinions uh, um, by Republicans. Um, um, and it happens from time to time, but I don't, I don't see the personal attacks. And, and um, um, so I don't, I don't know that it's to the same extent. Mm -hmm. um, Although we are seeing the, the, the non-verbal um, attacks, but we're all seeing violent attacks on some of yes. the federal judges. There was a report um, from the U.S. Marshals Service. In 2021, there were 4,500 threats of violence against federal judges. Mm -hmm. A very different level of attack. So there's a bill pending in Congress. Um, uh, uh, my colleague, Judge Salas, lost her family uh, yes. in, in New Jersey. Uh, my colleague, uh, Jane Lefko, lost her uh, husband and mother, I believe, and uh, somebody shows up at the door and blasts them. Um, 
I think we need to turn down the superheated rhetoric. Mm -hmm. um, I think at all levels we need to do that. And uh, I, I think that we, um, we appear to be in, in a post-objective truth society mm -hmm. these days. And um, I think we need to remember um, that we need to treat people the way we want to be treated. Mm -hmm. There's so much vitriol. Um, you know, I have to agree that social media contributes to this because everybody's trying to sell a product. And I, I think that whatever lame brain comment gets made, it gets transmitted all over the, the universe in, in seconds. And I think that um, if we expect the next generation to respect the judiciary, um, we have to stand up for the judiciary now, and I think we have to be mindful of the fact that we are not policy-making uh, um, entities. We are. Uh, we decide disputes. Mm -hmm. We decide um, um, criminal disputes, and we decide civil disputes, and we call balls and strikes, and we have no policy position in anything we uh, anything we do um, we make decisions based upon the facts the evidence and the law and at least at my level you have to uh, you have to follow precedent mm -hmm. and um, uh, whether precedent's been followed in other uh, situations I make no comment but uh, <laughs> um, it, it's that sort of uh, uh, of uh, thing that draws people's attention um, and I think we uh, we need as judges each of us each day in our in, in our courtrooms we need to to make sure that we're focusing on the matters that are before us and mm -hmm. and, and uh, that's what I try to do. Yeah. And you know, you, you all have me, you keep bringing up Chief Justice Earl Warren and what happened with Brown versus Board. And, you know, you think about that case, right? Had he, he was very, he showed leadership in a way that we don't often see going to each member to make sure the decision was unanimous because that was very important to him. Plessy versus Ferguson was an eight to one decision. Only John Harlan Marshall said that our constitution cannot stand with two classes of citizens. But Chief Justice Earl Warren knew the importance of that case to the country. Whose responsibility is it if we're going to, to, to attack judges, to one, get qualified people to agree to put themselves forward to be judges, but also think about if that decision had gone the other way. You have a whole group of black citizens being denied the right to vote, when would that ever change? And are we in a similar position now? And Judge, you may not be able to answer this, when we look at gerrymandering. I mean, how do the voices of citizens, how do we educate them on the importance of having a judiciary that is not political and only makes decisions based on the law and the evidence? You can answer that last part, Judge Watson. Hmm. <laughs> how do we educate citizens? Nothing about gerrymandering. <laughs> How do you educate citizens? I, I think I think uh, people need to stop reading uh, what they get on their phone, and they need to uh, spend a little time in history, mm -hmm. and and they need to uh, um, understand and try to understand the, the positions that that judges are in, and um, I, I I think that. You know, Chief Justice Roberts said, you know, we're not Clinton appointees, we're not Obama appointees, we're not Reagan appointees, we're not Bush appointees, we're, we're judges. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's apolitical. And I don't know any of my colleagues who feel any differently about it. Yeah. Did, I I do did I dodge that well you enough? Did. You did, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I, I can offer a couple of suggestions, yes. if you'll let me. Yes. Um, Organizations like the Columbus Bar Foundation have started trying to work on educating students with democracy. We did a dinner, free dinner. Uh, the Chief Justice spoke. John Meacham spoke this spring um, for high school kids and high school teachers. After the Mar-a-Lago search warrant, 
the bar of the city of New York issued a white paper about why uh, lawyers should not be going on Fox News and Real America and claiming the public should be terrified of the Justice Department. Um, Yvette's law firm is one of the big sponsors between September 19th and September 21st in Pittsburgh of an Eradicate Hate Global Summit that has some of the most distinguished people in the country uh, and from out of the country. Can can Canadians are coming. There's a speaker from Norway, and it's called Eradicate Hate. And the Jones Day firm and a number of other sponsors are putting on that three or four day summit. Um, and then Colleen's been very, or uh, Kathleen's been very effective in the American College of Trial Lawyers Judicial Independence Committee to try to work to uh, have trial lawyers um, work on educating the public, work on uh, responding to attacks on judges and so forth. There are a whole universe of solutions, um, but they all require people to get involved and not just to sit back and say, oh, gee, isn't it terrible? And so again, I applaud the fact that all of you took your time today to come here and think about this with us. Let me agree and disagree with Judge Watson, uh, a dissent, if you will, uh, Judge uh, Watson. <laughs> uh, I would agree on way, the way it used to be um, when presidents would nominate uh, people they think could do the good job regardless of whether they were uber liberal or uber conservative. And just to Yvette's point, a little history, if, if we go just as recently as Ronald Reagan's presidency, a very conservative presidency by the standards of his time, and I, was, I would say still so, Senator Day O'Connor was confirmed to the Supreme Court by a vote of 99 to zero. Mm -hmm. 12 years later, 1993, the first year of the Clinton presidency, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a little bit different than Senator Day O'Connor, was confirmed 96 to three. Things began changing a little over a decade ago <laughs> and when confirmation votes started becoming razor sharp based on vetting of nominees for ideological purity. In 09, Sonia Sotomayor was confirmed 68 to 31. You saw the tide shifting. In 2010, Elena Kagan was confirmed 63 to 37. Now let's fast forward to the last four years. Confirmation votes have become all out partisan warfare. Uh, Donald Trump promised when he campaigned, promised to elect judges who would overturn Roe and who deliver other desired outcomes by the hard right. Um, he outsourced the vetting of his potential nominees to the Federalist Society. That's open, That's, that was no secret. He just did that. And so last four years, what? What's happened, all out partisan warfare, Brett Kavanaugh in 2018 confirmed 50 to 48, the narrowest, the narrowest confirmation vote in 137 years. Uh, two years later, Amy Coney Barrett confirmed 52 to 48. And last year, Ketanji Brown Jackson confirmed 53 to 47. I say the, the sea change began during the Obama presidency with Mitch McConnell, a Senate majority yes. leader, when he vowed to have a courts project to block anybody that didn't meet a purity test. And so in the last year of Obama's presidency, there's a vacancy and uh, President Obama goes out of his way to try to nominate someone who just had a record of moderation. He, uh, he nominates um, Merrick Garland and he doesn't even get a courtesy call. There's a year stall where he doesn't even get a bottle of water. And uh, here we are with both sides dug in now uh, in an era where they are looking to vet potential nominees by an ideological purity test, because the R started it when they wanted to make sure they got no more David Souters, for God's sakes, and they didn't want to get any more uh, Harry Blackmans either. And so here we are. But PBS just did a series talking about it actually started with Bork, because remember how contentious Bork was, and they even show a young Mitch McConnell then saying, we will get them back. And he played the long game. I mean, literally denying President Obama a Supreme Court pick and then not applying the same rule to President Trump. He, he started that strategy as he started to rise through leadership that he was going to find a way. And that, I think, led to his courts project. Yeah, I would dissent from that, Yvette, by saying that Bork was a special case because he was proudly the lightning rod for an ideological uh, intellectual. Mm -hmm. And in his, in his hearings... He, to his own detriment, truthfully answered all the questions about how he would rule. <laughs> Shocking. <Yeah. laughs> and nobody said truthfully since then, I think. All right. <laughs>
Um, are we going to take, we have time for questions in the back, right? If people want to start to line up. And then um, uh, Kathleen, let me get you into this conversation. I'd like to follow up on the education issue that the judge talked about. And it's important, I think, that we do do the education in the K through 12 system. But I think, I don't think we can wait for another generation of voters to come along. I think we have to educate the adult population in terms of how important this is um, to our democracy. And I think the people in this room have a role to play. I mean, certainly the judges mm -hmm. do, and those of us who are lawyers um, have a really a professional obligation to get out there and help educate the public. But I think even those in the room who aren't lawyers, you have a you have networks, you have a community, you have um, you have alumni groups, you have all kinds of ties in the community. Invite a judge in or invite a lawyer in to your group to talk about these issues. This is a perfect forum. This is perfect. But we need to replicate this over and over Absolutely. again throughout the community. Because until the public, until the voters stand up and tell our elected officials, we want you to stop this behavior, it's not going to stop because right. the... Um, the public officials who are taking these positions are doing it in their own self-interest. They think that's what the public wants them to do, mm -hmm. like the Senate confirmation hearings. So we the, we, the people, have to take it back. We have to become educated, and we have to tell our, our, our elected leaders we don't want this to go on anymore. Yeah, Justice Katenji Brown-Jackson said she met with all of the Republican Senate Judiciary Committee members, and they were lovely in, in personal meetings. And so she didn't take it personally during the, the Senate confirmation hearings because she knew that they were just playing for their base. But they were not like that at all when she met with them in their offices and talked about their her qualifications for the bench. Jane, did you have a question? We have lots and lots of questions, and we'll do every other one here. So if you have a question, please come up. David Eichenberg, uh, will there be any discussion about when judges attack their peers, especially in court decisions? Oh, interesting. Well, let me talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you who the judge is, but I brought an op-ed page from our home newspaper uh, written by a judge recently and the byline, which I know was not written by the author because the editorial writers write the headlines, was judges steal your power, give it to themselves. Um, I think it really does a great disservice to the profession and to the community when judges attack the system or act like the rest of us are jackasses and vote for them. Um, mm -hmm. This is an election year. I put it aside in that pile, and that's why I'm not going to talk about who wrote it, but it is a, really a bad thing when judges attack the system. Does Judge that Watson. answer the question? Judge Watson, did you want to add anything or? No? I agree completely with what <laughs> Judge Driver said. Uh, you know, I think there is far too much vitriol, as I mm -hmm. said, and, and there's a lack of respect. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lack of respect in the legislature. There's a lack of respect in um, the media. There's a lack of respect on multi-judge courts. I can tell you that your United States District Court in the Southern District of Ohio is a very collegial court. We are thankful for that. Too. And um, and I'm and I'm pleased uh, that we are that way. Now, do we have internal squabbles from time to time? Mm -hmm. Yes, but you'll never see it break out into the public, and nobody will ever know about it. Um, we are doing. Uh, civics education. Judge Newman over in Dayton is a big proponent of that. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, you know, I just did a, a naturalization the other day. And part of my spiel to, to the folks that were naturalizing is we've held our government together uh, through a peaceful transition every four to eight years at the polls for 246 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I encourage those folks to share what they've been through because, you know, they come from war-torn countries. They come from ungodly strife that we have no idea about here in the United States. And they can't even understand why we pick at each other the way that we do. Yeah. We are so entitled and so fortunate um, and, and 
to be here uh, by accident of birth. And, and, and so, you know, I, I think that uh, I'm, I'm doing a naturalization at, uh, at uh, Kilbourne High School in, uh, um, in November, and I invite you all to come. So um, it's an opportunity. We generally have uh, members of the clergy that'll, that, will, that will participate in that. Uh, Judge Sargas is out uh, doing things in the community. Um, I'm doing things in the community. We're, we're doing our best from where we are. There's, there's not a great deal we can do to attack, an, yeah. you know, um, sy systemically the whole problem. I just think you call, you call somebody out when, when they've crossed the line and there's too much cro crossing of the line. Mm -hmm. There is a lack of respect in the, in the legislatures. They don't talk to each other. They don't get things done. And I think that um, that's what frustrates people. Absolutely. Both at the state and the federal level. I think, I think, it, I think it frustrates people. Carol? My name is Carol Looper, and my question is, this November, there will be designation, Republican or Democrat, on the ballot next to Supreme, uh, Ohio Supreme Court judges and appeals court judges. Isn't that partisan? And if you're going to have a party line next to a judge's name, why not have all the judges' parties on the ballot? Who wants to take that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a party line vote. You know how to do that. The R's are for it. The D's were against. Obviously, the R's think it'll be a benefit. Uh, Ohio has been, become trending more red in recent election cycles. Uh, control of the Supreme Court is at stake. Everybody knows that. Uh, this November, it was with an eye toward those races first and firm, foremost. Um, they didn't consult the Ohio Judicial Conference, which represents 700 plus judges in this state didn't want their uh, input. So the expectation was that this will help Republicans at the top. So we're going to do it. Um, we'll see. Sometimes there's a law of unintended consequences with those. Word, I think pretty good word. I won't ask the chief to uh, validate it or not. But uh, was it uh, Justice Sharon Kennedy wasn't too keen on that because in her recent, in her previous elections for the for, um, Supreme Court, she's done fairly well. In urban areas with that with that Kennedy name. Conversely, Justice Bruner has outperformed most Democrats in uh, some pretty red counties. Uh, good German surname, Western Ohio does pretty well. Uh, <laughs> you know, so so who knows? Um, you know, but the intent was this would help Republicans. They're in power. They can do what they want to do, and uh, so. If you're a betting person, it's probably going to help the R's, but I wouldn't bet the ranch because every race is different and um, candidates are different. And in urban areas, I think it helps the Democrats if uh, past election results are followed. Uh, when I joined the bench, I was the fourth out of 16 Democrats on the Franklin County Common Pleas bench. It's flipped. I think now there are four Republicans left. Mm -hmm. um, so the appellate judges in Franklin County and the people who vote for Supreme Court will have that clue about R and D. And I, I don't think that's good that it's slanted in urban areas one way or slanted in rural areas another way. Agreed. So, so Kathy Fox and Richard Needles both have a similar question, so I'm going to combine them. Did the legislature add to the public perception problem by ignoring Ohio's Supreme Court rulings such as the school funding and redistricting? Mm -hmm. You want to go with first, Kathleen? Kathleen? <laughs> I think the answer to that is yes. It goes mm -hmm. back to that the, all the branches of government have to respect each other. And certainly the legislature has to respect the decisions of the court. And the decisions of the court um, you know, have to respect the laws as passed by the legislature. So, yes, that, that is a problem. We're all rooting here that uh, once uh, the Chief Justice is out of office and she's a free lady, she write, writes a little memoir kind of giving us some uh, <laughs> some perspective on, on some of these things. But they had a big decision to make. Do you hold the legislature or the, do you hold the redistricting commission in contempt or not? They could have. They clearly ignored the uh, the, the, the court order. The, the Supreme Court interprets the high constitution. They ruled unconstitutional and we got a stalemate. Um, and the chief wrote in her 
uh, opinion that it may take another amendment to the Ohio Constitution. I agree with that. I think it will to nail down, um, uh, you know, what has to occur because now we've got this uh, loophole, you know, created by the majority, apparent, you know, uh, loophole. And uh, for those of you who are real junkies, I would say go Google the Iowa plan. I'm, I'm here to, uh, to sell the Iowa plan uh, for redistricting and reapportionment. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, the best out there, and hopefully Ohio will have something very similar to the Iowa plan in the not-too-distant future. Right. You know, one of the things that's funny is during the redistricting, I had a New York Times reporter call me and ask me about um, what the court might do, and, I, and he mentioned DeRolf, and I said, well, you know, Chief Justice Moyer used to always say, what do you want me to do, put 100 General Assembly people in jail? They, they have, I've given the order, they got to do it. I said, but the, the uh, redistricting commission is seven people. You can put seven people in jail. So that was my thought. <laughs> in the room today and one of the great legacies of the Taft uh, uh, tenure, his eight year tenure as governor was uh, the work to bring the poor school districts up to par. Mm -hmm. The tremendous school building that went on the the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars the state spent to do its best effort to respond to DeRolf. And if you tour the state and look at a lot of the schools now, but what they were 20 years ago, it's a testament to the work of a lot of good people, especially including Governor Taft. Mm -hmm. That's right. Next question, please. I'm John Lowe. In these discussions, it seems to me that we bend over backwards to talk about balance and there's trouble on both sides of the political aisle and all that stuff. I grew up in a Republican household, but I gotta tell you, I don't see it that way at all. If, if Donald Trump isn't the primary, the biggest source of vitriol, I think we're missing the point. Do you folks have any comments to make about that? Are you... Uh, uh, you see it similarly or not? I'd be happy to comment on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I think the last six years have made really been a watershed of that. Mm -hmm. And I think the president, former president, when he started his tweets and attacks on the judiciary, was just telling the public, don't respect him. I don't respect the courts. You don't need to respect the courts. And that trickles down to what Judge Fry was talking about. And it's, it's, I think that was really a major, major change. And now we're seeing it at the state levels as well. Mm -hmm. um, one thing we haven't really talked about is some of the, the court curbing bills that are coming out. We now across the country in, in um, numerous states that you have the legislatures trying to cut back on the, the jurisdiction of the courts or even punishing the courts because they um, gave an unpopular decision either by way of impeachment. Some states have bills pending where they're going to cut the court's budgets because they um, were unpopular decisions. And, you know, it's a matter of record that most of these are across the country are um, legislatures of one party as opposed to the other. Please, people, pay attention to history. That's exactly what happened in the early 30s in Germany. Jane? So I guess this leads into that question and not to be proposing conspiracies, but are there current political leaders trying to purposely deteriorate the judicial system for the purpose of changing the very democratic structure that we're under? Could, could you repeat the question? I didn't get the question clearly. Can we hear the question again? Yes. Um, are there current political leaders trying to purposefully deteriorate the judicial system for the purpose of changing the very democratic structure that we have? I wouldn't go that far far personally, um, that there's a conscious effort to tear down or change the, you know, the, the branches of government as we know them or to, you know, uh, deteriorate the judicial branch uh, to make it less and less effective. Um, I'm not saying that there couldn't be an effort to do that at some point, but um, I think the effort is to get ours in and keep theirs out and by any means possible. And what we've been witnessing over the last several election cycles, certainly starting at the Supreme Court, is all out warfare to get our judges, or as Donald Trump said, my judges uh, on the court so they can do what we expect them to do. Uh, could it get worse than that? It, it, it certainly could, but um, we have to find ways collectively to break that fever. 
Next question. Thank you. My name is Karen Twynham. I the, the title of this series is Democracy in Crisis, and I think when you have, I've seen figures more than 75% of people not respecting the Supreme Court, that's a crisis. And some of it, it's not all social media. Um, I, my question is, what happens or what should happen when the spouse of a Supreme Court justice is actively trying to overthrow an election? Uh, what what are the uh, parameters around that? Are there is there any anything people can do to um, try to, you know, stop a conflict of interest? I'd just like to hear your thoughts. What's well, interesting the the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't really have um, ethics rules in the same way that all lawyers and judges in the states have to abide by. So, um, the, a Supreme Court justice's wife is a private citizen, but the justice at the U.S. Supreme Court has to make, can make their own decision about whether they recuse themselves or not. And there really is nobody to tell them they have to. Um, and that, that's something that I think Congress needs to look at. Do one of my non-judges want to comment on that? <laughs> I, I think we will start to see um, calls for some kind of code of judicial conduct that even applies to the Supreme Court. I don't, I, if Justice Roberts doesn't do it on his own initiative, I think you're going to start to hear a hue and cry from the from the public or certainly from the lawyers saying there ought to be um, rules that apply even to the Supreme Court um, to have more transparency. Um, so I think I think this current situation will prompt some some initiatives in that direction. Two items in the silver lining department. One is there are bills pending in Congress right now from both Democratic sponsors and Republican sponsors to do that, to create a code of judicial conduct for the Supreme Court. God knows we need it. Secondly, there have been for many years bills and uh, policy papers kicking around uh, in Washington from both far right, uh, federal society, far left, um, name your group, uh, for term limits of 18 years. Mm -hmm. and in fact, the first time I saw that, it came from the Federal Society quite mm -hmm. a few years ago. Um, that's got some traction. Uh, term limits of 18 years, whereby a sitting president would have an opportunity to uh, nominate uh, two justices, once at one every two years, and the, the justice who'd, who'd been there longest would go on senior status, still able to sit in where, when need be, if somebody's conflicted out, if we have that ethics code, or is disposed, dis, uh, dis, disposed for some reason. Um, to me, trying to be a, just call balls and strikes, which I do for a living, mm -hmm. quite frankly. Um, I, it, I do, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm an umpire, so I've been doing it for some time. It's, <laughs> it's got a lot of merit to it. I had a conversation some years ago at a conference for judges and lawyers with a Supreme Court justice from Canada. And they've got this uh, relatively short, I think they do 12 years, but maybe I'm remembering wrong. But he made the point that a lot of their judges, justices, will serve on the Canadian Supreme Court and then get an offer to go teach, or they'll get an offer to go back with a law firm, or they'll have had the experience as a Supreme Court justice, and it's not a lifetime deal, and they'll leave early. Mm -hmm. It's much lower uh, pressure on the judge, and it's much less of a political controversy to have a confirmation hearing and we think this person's going to last for the next 30 years. So uh, as Mike says, the 18 year term thing might fit to the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope it does get continued study. But uh, one of the hard questions is, can you do it with a statute or do you have to amend the Constitution? And amending the U.S. Constitution oh, is uh, <laughs> what challenging. On, what does on good behavior mean? Well, <laughs> right, that too. Right. Yeah. That's well, I know we've got to wrap up, but Bill Weisenberger's back there, and he will. You don't have a question? You will make my life miserable if I don't let you ask this question. So go, Bill. <laughs> my question is: You've all talked about what we need to do. The question I have is, and you've all addressed this: There has been a constant, consistent erosion of public trust and confidence in the courts for some time now. How do we address that? In this room, we have a highly educated group of people, but we have 11 million Ohioans out there, many of whom are not educated. I submit to you that some of the problem is self-inflicted. 
because we have not historically taken the lead on defining who we are. Because if we look where people get their information, John Grisham is probably one of the prime sources, Scott Turow, my personal hero, Denny Crane from Boston Legal, and, and you mentioned Perry Mason. The, the problem I think we have is, until we carefully define and educate the public on what I call, and you refer to, the least understood branch, mm -hmm. and start through civic education at the elementary level, and continue through adult education, until we have a truly informed citizenry, the erosion will continue. So my final question is, what do you suggest we do as a state, as the state of Ohio? And you've got 60 seconds. Real you've got quick. 60 seconds. Whoever wants to take it, go. Well, I, I do think the point I was making earlier about adult education is so important. And so I would encourage people in this room and encourage if there's a way we can get the state behind this to have forums like this not just in Columbus and Cleveland, but get out into all the communities. Because I think we have judges who are willing to go out and speak to the communities. Um, certainly the, at both the federal and state court judges would be willing to do that. We've got lawyers who have a professional obligation to go out there and bring the message about the courts and what the, their value and how they should be respected. We just need to have an audience willing to have us come and talk to them. Perfect. And I think if we can find a way to identify the audiences like this one, and then people in this room go back to your other connections and say, we you'd like to hear about this. Let's invite one of the judges. Let's invite one of the lawyers to come and talk to our group about this. Then I think we can start making an impact. And as precipitous as a drop has been in public confidence in the courts, uh, the courts have lots of company. The, the drop has been just as precipitous for the presidency, for Congress, for newspapers, uh, news media in general, uh, and most other core institutions that used to have high confidence. So we have to have civics education on steroids in all of our high schools and all of our colleges and incentivize a robust program all across the board. Please join me in thanking my panelists. Hopefully you found today's forum as thought provoking and inspiring as I did. I hope it will encourage you to go out and continue this conversation and pick up on some of the points that our presenters uh, shared with us today. Thank you to CMC's Democracy in Crisis series partner, WOSU Public Media. Today's forum sponsors, the Chief Justice Thomas J. Moyer Legacy Committee of the Ohio State Bar Association, Ulmer and Byrne, our online virtual seat patrons, the Columbus Dispatch, and also one that I forgot to mention earlier, the Human Kindness Founda Fund of the Columbus Foundation. We appreciate uh, all of these uh, sponsors and also please help me again in thanking our presenters, Michael Curtin, Judge Richard Fry, Kathleen Trafford, Judge Michael Watson, and our host, Yvette McGee-Brown. A couple of quick notes. A, uh, I, I forgot to also mention a new member, Kevin Smith, who's with Kiplinger Program in Public Affairs Journalism. And a happy birthday to our longtime member, George Arnold. <laughs> Please make plans to join us next Wednesday as we host leaders working together to solve Ohio's tragic suicide epidemic. Thank you all for joining us. We could not do this without you. We look forward to seeing you next week.